time. My name is Peter Saint. Welcome to the Workshop Therapy Podcast. I'm Andrew. This is my wife, Tamara, who's my guest because I have no one else to talk to. No one else I'd rather talk to. <laughs> you are my guest, yes. And you're the person that I would most enjoy talking to. <laughs> I'm glad. You're the person I would enjoy most talking to, which is why I talk to you all the time when you don't want to. Also true. <laughs> so how's the art therapy class going? Well, day two, I'm going strong. The art therapist. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see how it goes. This is just like a dip your feet into it see what it's like um i don't know i would be doing my masters and another couple years of school they know how it goes i do i enjoy what i've done so far yes good notice you seem to be enjoying it doing your homework last night and today <laughs> i think um yeah like it's something that i found joy in and was like found myself thinking about when i wasn't doing it and there's I, not always in my academic career has that been the case get the assignment done and then move on yeah I mean, there's lots of thinking about the assignment. Oh, no, I have this assignment coming up and I'm in trouble because it's due tomorrow and I haven't done it. So then I pull an all-in-nighter because it gives me that dopamine hit to push it really hard. And, I mean, it turned out I did okay at school, but um, I shouldn't say it all about that because I did put in a lot of hard work go through school. But I don't know. I So I did. You're not saying anything. You're so quiet. Because I'm, I'm practicing active listening. Okay. So for those who don't know, I have a bachelor's degree in music and a bachelor's degree in education. Um, my bachelor's degree in music was, I, I would say it was very intense for those who have been, been in a performance space. Um, anything, it's intense. There was a lot of, a lot of pressure, a lot of uh, practice time, a lot of... It's also know. a lot of subjectivity to it, right? Like, yeah. Like there wasn't a two plus two equals four situation it was always what is this judge and this adjudicator think and what does this adjudicator think and what yeah. does this professor think and, and then all of those evaluations so you're constantly juggling three or four different people's opinions and, and not and, necessarily fact that you can argue exactly and and some of that opinion was down to like did they like your outfit did they like your hair were you wearing glasses like and i'm not kidding those were really things that you were judged on for your performance which is absurd given that you should be, I mean, it's the music that you're being judged on that you're creating or should be judged on. No, agreed. Totally agreed. I have um, astigmatism and I have tried contacts. I don't like them. They're just not for me. It's not, I have not found them to be comforting, comfortable, enjoyable, whatever. And so I knew going into my um, junior and graduation recital that I automatically docked myself 5% because I wasn't wearing contacts. And I knew that. I knew that was gone. But I couldn't. I wonder if that's still a thing, you know, given the, I don't know. the world's change in, <laughs> in reception on that type of stuff. Well, not that type of stuff. I mean, you can you can be a man wearing a dress now, and that's perfectly acceptable. Why can't you be a woman wearing glasses? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So when, when I did it, that was things that I dealt with, and, and um, it was stressful. And music was something that I loved, and you will attest to um, my major was flute, and I rarely play. Yep. I play other instruments. She has a flute that's worth more, more than my pickup truck. No, it's not. It totally is. It is not. But anyway, I don't play very often because it became, I became servant, not master. I think maybe is a good way of thinking about it. And so it took something that I, I loved and found joy in and made it almost painful. Would you say it took away the intrinsic motivation? Yeah. And I think, actually, I was listening to Sean Johnson talk about when she was done the Olympics. The next, the first morning after it was over, just sitting there and being like, I can eat whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. Who's Sean Johnson? She was a gymnast, oh. an American gymnast. Anyway, and, and, and just being like, she didn't know what to do. And it was such a wall. And I, I, I felt like that when I graduated from performance, suddenly I wasn't practicing eight hours a day. I wasn't um, getting ready for this big thing that like, you know, it had been every semester, you're getting ready for this, getting ready for this, you're this performance, that performance, going to recitals. And then all of a sudden, all of that was gone. And I think because I hadn't done, I hadn't really done it in the way that brought me joy. When it was gone, it was a relief that it was gone. And it took me a while to find joy in that again. And then I did. I mean, one of the other reasons that I don't play my flute a lot is because I'm loud. And I know I'm loud. And we have neurodiversity in at least one of our children um, that makes my playing of that frustrating to them. Yeah. 
right? Like I play the digital piano, but I can turn the volume down. I play my ukulele, but the ukulele is not nearly as loud as a performance flute. Yeah, yeah, because your flute is designed to be heard among a hundred other instruments as well, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, when I did my graduation recital, I was unmiked on stage with a grand piano and I could be heard clearly. So it's, it's loud and it's high. And for our son, since he was little, he has not liked it. So he does not like it. Always like it. And it's not, um, and so that's, I mean, that's hard, right? Because it's something that I do love, but I, yeah. So recently we've been trying to discover a little bit more about ourselves. And, and I've been thinking about things that I've maybe put on the back burner or didn't really do. And I would have really liked to have gone into art in the first place. I really enjoy art. I don't know that I'm necessarily amazing at it, but I enjoy art and the artistic process. And Vincent Van Gogh would uh, disagree. <laughs> that was not very good. 15 minute Van Gogh starry night. But anyhow. Yeah, exactly. Um, 15 minutes is what it took for to paint that. If, if you're wondering <laughs> what I'm talking about, uh, if you missed missed the uh, Instagram reel, it's on there. Maybe I'll link it in the show description if I remember to do that. Anyway, I, um, I enjoy painting and I enjoy lots of different artistic things. I enjoy spinning and weaving and clay and all kinds of different things. And I think maybe that's part of what I like about this course that I'm taking is about expressing yourself in different ways and you're not judging yourself on is my piece that I've created today as amazing as somebody else's is what does this express about yeah the, the end goal isn't to impress somebody else it's to express yourself so there is no there's no marks associated with it so you can be yeah a little bit more free with what you're doing yeah and I think like I think that's something that I struggled with in music because I wanted to play songs that made me feel something and I had to play songs because they were in the that grade level and I had to do this because this was a Vival or a, I can't remember who it was Sonata and it was a Mozart how did I forget that I hated him but it was like 17 minutes of straight playing and it was monotonous and there was no soul to it and I hated it and I had to play it yeah that's what production woodworking does for me too is like I I, I enjoy woodworking and I enjoy making stuff but and and when I get but when I get a, a commission for something that's a repetitive thing like the the real estate agent Cut cutting boards, boards yeah. I don't mind making cutting boards but when I'm making 50 of them at a time it gets pretty blah yeah and frustrating so what what inspired you to start taking this course because I want to do some I think you did honestly doing going back and doing your master's because I want to keep learning and art therapy is something that I have thought about doing before but I'm not really sure and I don't have a degree in art and so there's like a few things on that and so when I was looking up <laughs> Udemy sent me an email yesterday saying they had to say a lot and I was like you know what I want to try it I thought it was because we had a couples therapy session well that did help actually why did that help because you talked about we talked to uh, get into all of it but there was a lot of discussion about sadness and how sadness brings fear anxiety and depression and and it's very true and i get stuck in that fear anxiety depression loop often and the counts the therapist that we were talking to he it was maybe more he had a different perspective on it than i had previously had from a therapist and 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 just talking more about how we can we can choose to do things to bring us joy and to grow i don't know i'm not like saying this like me too yeah so just to to put in the shameless plug right now um where you've probably seen on some of the youtube channels and stuff that are common in the community the company better help are sponsoring videos a lot recently and they're an online therapy delivery service i guess and uh that's what we started using as a as a couple not that we're having marital issues no i don't think anyway <laughs> if they are they're well hidden me, yeah, <laughs> we're doing good. but um therapy isn't just about you know crushing mental burden it's also can be to, to help have somebody to bounce things off of you know coaching or, or whatever but we started using this to <coughs> excuse me um help find direction maybe yeah and so if you're interested in using better help there is an affiliate link in the show description uh, feel free to check it out we've been enjoying it so far and yeah it's been in, it's been helpful because it has number one it's inspired my wife and, and she's been you've been looking i've talked for, about doing this for a long time yeah for a long time and you've looked at more master programs than i have <laughs> yeah i have 
So it's been a while. And I think there's that, this, this, take this for what, it will, what you will on my part. I think your music degree kind of crushed your intrinsic motivation to do a lot of things. No, it did. I was very, I, I will totally say this. I was very broken coming out of that degree in many ways. And I can see it a lot more now than I even could then, but I knew I was broken. It was, it was tough. Um, and for many reasons and for maybe like also going into like knowing that we have some neurodiversity and that tends to run in families and starting to see things in myself. I'm like, oh yeah, no wonder some of that was really hard, but it, it wasn't. I have no neurodiversity problems myself. No, I'm a completely none. balanced, normal, introverted, yep. world hating ADHD. ADHD person. You're fine. Um, no, it did. It, it, it crushed a lot of things in me. Um, actually, I yesterday I had um, a friend text me and ask if I would play a piano and organ duet with her for an upcoming Christmas concert. And you can say it's for our church. That's okay. Yeah, for church. And I, um, I said yes. And I know that, like, I know that I want to do it, but I know when I'm up there, like, I know that I'm going to want you to like hold my hand until I have to go up, and I will be a bundle of sweat when I get back down. And I've performed a ton. I've performed in orchestras. I've performed solo. I've performed a ton. But nerves get the better of me. And this particular friend um, is an amazing pianist. She's phenomenal. But she has never felt nervous. We've had this conversation. She has never felt nervous getting up before me. And I just don't get that. My, I just, I have no reference point for that at all. Even when you were younger, before you went to university, did you still get nervous? Oh my gosh, yes. Yes. I can remember my first recital. I'm feeling like I wanted to throw up walking up to the piano. Which is funny for me. I, I mean, I'm, I'm probably biased in the extreme. However, I'd rather listen to you play than Fran. Even though I know that your friend is... Technically, she's so much better yeah, than me. I know she's better than me. Yeah, she is. She, she she's is technically a, a superior, superior piano player to you. However, I would rather listen to you play because when I watch your friend play... She plays the music. She sits there and she plays the piano. She doesn't and swing when, back and forth. And when this, <laughs> yeah, when the song is done, she's done. I'm not. You, on the other hand, watching you play, you're very clearly more engaged in the music. Than, because it's than a part is. of... Yeah, and so for me, at least, I think that comes through in how the music comes out. It, it's There's a, a soul to it more so than when perhaps more technical, technically accomplished players... Yeah, like she's amazing and I love listening to her play. But I like I know I and I think now talking to you about it, I think that's part of it is there's like a piece of me that goes into everything. Just like there's a piece of you that goes into the art that you make or whatever you create in the workshop, right? Like when you're creating it and you're coming up with it. I don't know how to else to explain it, but it's like you and that's why sometimes it's hard to to show it to people or to let it be out there. Yeah. I love like Celtic music. I love it, but there's a soul in that. That makes me wonder about uh, craftsmanship versus art. Yeah. You know, like there's an owl just across there. Did it? Yeah. I missed it. We're driving, for those who don't know. We <laughs> we had a date night. I did. Um, and it was nice. Anyway, um, creativity and or, or craftsmanship versus art. You know, like. I don't know where you stand on what is art spectrum, but you know, like that, that pile of yellow scrap wood at the art gallery in Springfield. Yeah. You know, I could do that. In fact, I think, I think our daughter has done that with the hot glue gun. Oh, multiple times. To, multiple times. To paint it. But, but so what makes that art versus craftsmanship? I mean, I don't, I honestly don't think there was any craftsmanship in it at all, but apparently with art, is it, is it kind of the emotion? behind it that, that you feel i think so that's the way it is for me so then in the pursuit of i think uh, like the assignments that i've done so far because i like to deep dive into everything and so i've done maybe more than i should have in two days but um i found myself at the first assignment being like oh, here's the assignment oh, i'm gonna go check the threads and see what other people did before i did it uh-huh. and then i caught myself and i think this is from directly from the therapy session actually and it was like I don't have to do what anybody else does or did, or I need to do what is inside me. And that takes longer. That's harder. It's easy for me to mirror somebody else and change it and make it me or the me that I want to present to the world. It's a lot harder to read something and then do your interpretation and hand that in. Do you know what I mean? 
yeah, it's harder to pursue the authentic self than it is to interpret the image that other people want you to be and portray that image. And because I think... you don't have to, you don't have to think on your own. You, you just have to figure out what that person wants you to be and show it to. Yeah, and I think that's where music really broke me was because um, they were very clear. For every positive, you should receive ten negatives. That was the way it was. Which is funny in an educational setting because educational <laughs> psychology is exactly the opposite. My first day in every music class was, we expect 50% of you gone by Christmas. And it was tough. And I think that like going through that, I my tendencies to want to people please anyway became so strong that I lost my sense of who I was in that. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I, I became like, I have to do play this the way that you want to hear it. I have to not the way that I hear it in my head, not the way that I feel it. And I did, I do find myself if I go back and play any of those pieces, there is no joy in most of them. There was a Rachmaninoff piece that I loved and I do still find joy in that piece. I don't know if I could play it now. It was pretty intense, but, um, but it was the one piece because it was, and this is where I started playing more 20, um, first century music because you were allowed to interpret that. So there was personal interpretation allowed in that where in like other genres, there wasn't. You had to play exactly what was written. And there, that was a frustration too, because I'm like, okay, but the publisher, the you can find six this. different publications of this Mozart Sonata and they all have different markings in them. So I'm still just playing somebody's opinion of what this was supposed to sound like. Yeah. Yeah. There's no... There's no Beethoven and, and Mozart recordings. No, but when you're you're forced to play it that way and you have to hand your adjudicator your music and you can't have any pencil markings on it to change anything, it has to be random side what note. it was. That's where uh, Dusty Lumber Co's shop is. Oh, okay. I'm going to tag you in this just for, because it's social media. Drove and it. nobody can tell where I'm pointing because this is an audio <laughs> format. Um, so that was difficult, I found. And uh, as well, when you're playing in an orchestra, you learn you have to play it the way that everybody else around you is playing it. And you have practice sessions where you're just learning how to play exactly the same thing, exactly the same way. And, and there is a place for that. When you're in a group. When you're in a group. And, and when, when you're playing group. in the orchestra, and that's great. But I started to feel like, for me, like, I know that when I was doing my degree, I was like, it doesn't matter if I'm here or not here. There's, I mean, there's always an abundance of flute players. Yeah, you're interchangeable with every other flute player. It doesn't, I'm not so wonderful that this song is going to sound amazing because I'm here. Yeah, case in point, the, so what is there in an orchestra? Three flutes? Six flutes? Um, it depends on the orchestra. Okay, well, so you were second chair, right? So you're the second flute or whatever, however that works. Yeah. And I, I happen to know the first flute and you're superior to her talent wise. Yeah, but she was first flute because she played the game and I didn't. Yeah. And so there was a subjective thing there and that, that would be frustrating. And, I, and, and, when and uh, by that, I mean, she directed with the professor and I did it. Yeah. And so that's where a while back in the podcast on, my social media stuff, I talked about the whole thousand fiddlers for every composer. And it's the same as same art craftsmanship. There's lots and lots of people who can take a set of plans, whether they're they're written music or drafted out woodworking plans, they can take those plans and they can accomplish that thing and make the thing. But they're incapable of of coming up with that thing on their own. Yeah. Like my my jointer is a is a good example of that. Uh, the person I got the jointer from, he's a really good woodworker. He made this Sam Maloof style rock chair. Oh, it's phenomenal! And it, it's beautiful. It's, it's it's I, I well at the time it's more than I could do. Uh, I haven't attempted to, but I'm sure if I was following plans I could. Uh, but maybe not. I don't know. But anyway, you can make I'll, I'll attempt to. Anyway, he 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 had this jointer. And he was afraid to use it because it threw a knife, and because one of the one of the sense screws wasn't tightened down properly, and there was some damage to it, and, and blah blah blah. And and so he sold it, uh, an eight inch jointer to me for what was it like two hundred bucks? Something, I don't like know, that. something like that. And you know, it, it took me all of I don't know an hour maybe yeah, of work to, to fix it. And I was talking to him about it later, and, and he was just, oh yeah, I have no idea how how you do. It. I just could figure it out. Yeah, and I've talked to him a few times about stuff. He's just he just can't deviate from a plan. He's gotta buy a plan to, to do his thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
there, think there's, there's a lots place of people that are really happy with that. Yeah, they're, they're mentally, absolutely. I'm not, and I think coming to that understanding. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like. Yeah, there's lot. There's lots because of because it's okay that... to say like, yeah, I I don't love playing an orchestra because I don't like playing the same thing as everybody else beside me. Well, I think it's more than that too. I it's don't. Not just the playing the same thing as everybody else. It's as as much as there's lots of people who like to play music because they they enjoy the sound of music and they enjoy being able to produce music or produce a woodwork thing. And the the production of it is the joy. Yeah. Right? Like that's the, it's relaxing to sit down and read some music and play some, play some notes. Well, but what or, I mean, like, yeah, there's also people are happy to do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. I'm not that person. No, and and there's a there's a joy in that, but there's also a joy in the in creativity and the exploring something new and trying new things. As a consequence, you tend to make more mistakes doing that. You do. But I think you end up at the end. The mistakes bring knowledge, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's um like oh, okay, I, turn your lights down. Yeah. I mean, right. People in their high beam. Uh the when I was talking to you yesterday or the day before about about being in performance mode where you're focused on just not making mistakes. Yeah. Versus being in learning mode where you're you're finding the mistakes and you're learning from them trying to overcome it. yeah so when you're in a when you're in a, a performance situation you're just focused on doing what you know how to do and not messing up yeah and you avoid the thing that you don't know how to do or you know that you're going to make a mistake at because that takes away from the performance yeah. whereas when you're in a practice mode you're trying to push your boundaries you're trying to grow your skill set whatever that skill set may be whether it's a, a knowledge or a or a woodworking skill or a music skill or a blacksmithing whatever it is when you're in a practice mode you're trying to expand that uh -huh. that makes sense yeah i agree but then you you get that's where you get going back to intrinsic and extrinsic motivation as well that's where you get people who i think people who are performance bound they're very um extrinsically motivated yeah because like once i didn't have a performance to work for what why why did i need to practice yeah and and to be frank your skill has decreased oh it has because you have not practiced it has and i would i like to pick it up and do more again yes this stage of life is maybe not that for me when we have three busy kids at home school and um, all of that and not a place where i can do so without annoying everybody else else and I can't go outside because the neighbors are being here. And I can't go outside because weather and flutes and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so. But on on that, I think that my diversity as a musician has increased since I left school. Yeah, well, I mean. Because I'm not just playing flute anymore. I mean, I played flute and piano and organ, but I think my my skills on like the ukulele and when I top end and learn how to play all kinds of different instruments. And I think, so I think my musicality and my ability to try new things has increased exponentially over what I had because before it was like, well, I play flute. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That being it. said, two years of band and I learned that was not the career for me. Yep. I don't know how people do it, teaching the same songs over and over and over again. Two years of beginner band was more than, the first year was kind of fun. The second year I was done. So what do you think that speaks to pursuing your art or your passion as a career? Do you think that, that the advice of find something you love and you'll never work a day in your life, do you I, think that's true? Or do I you think, think this is where fallacy? you and I like, this is where I have a hard time because I did love music. I did. And I loved playing my flute, but I came to hate it. And I think maybe that's a word I haven't necessarily, but it, but it did become almost loathsome because there was so much tied up into it that that the joy was gone. But here's here's my follow up question: Is that because you felt forced into it, or is that because of the degree itself? Like, do you, do you think that if you I think it was a combination made a of choice things. of I want to do my music degree versus feeling coerced and compelled into it, which you've told me you. Well, kind of did, but I think, like, it wasn't that I didn't, like, I suffer definitely from the, I never feel like I'm good enough, and so I did, I maybe didn't put as much, I don't know how to say what I mean, but to some extent, I felt like it was the only thing I could get into as well. Like, I really wanted to go to university, but because of bad guidance, counselor, and things, I didn't have credentials for everything, but I did, you know, pass the audition and have everything I needed to get into music and was able to get into it, which was great, um, but... And I think you can love more than one thing. I, I really loved art as well. Like in high school, I took every art class I could. I loved art. I don't know that I was like amazing at anything, but I enjoyed the process. And maybe because there wasn't concerts, we did have 
We did have a like showing, like where you were painting out yeah, art shows. Yeah, but they got like judged, and you got scholarships and stuff. And and I did win something, but it wasn't. There wasn't the same level of. There wasn't the same level of lead up to it. I don't know. Like when you're when I was leading up to like a, a performance for a festival, like an adjudication, it, there was so many hours of practice and so much. And not that I didn't put tons of time into my paintings and stuff, but yeah, but you weren't painting the same painting over and over and over and over to get it perfect. Exactly. Once I got it to where I wanted it, it could be done. But and I think maybe that's where it comes in. It's that it, intrinsic motivation. It, it was up to me when it was done, not up to my teacher or the adjudicator or my parents or anybody else, right? And and I think to some extent, like, I love my parents and they exposed me to tons of amazing, like, 60s, 70s rock music and that kind of stuff. But they hate classical music. And so being the kid playing classical music in the house was sometimes difficult. And so I think there's a lot of things that play into that. But I think, like, the extrinsic, it was definitely extrinsic. It was for awards and trying to make people proud of it probably more than... It wasn't about personal expression. Yeah. The art was about personal expression. And, and I wish that I had done more of that. Well, you were. Yeah, so now I'm trying to find more, find more joy. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. What do you think? Yeah, so. Thanks for being on. You're welcome. Rambly as usual. Hopefully the audio is clean enough while we're driving that it'll make a podcast. Otherwise, we'll have to have another conversation sometime. Sure. You can prepare me about it. We're good. So if you found anything from this episode to be helpful and you want to reinforce it for yourself, I'd like to invite you to share it with a friend in the next 24 hours. That'll help reinforce it in your mind and it'll help those around you which is always a good thing. So thanks again for listening. And now I'd like to say thank you to all the amazing patrons of the Workshop Therapy Podcast. You guys make the show possible. If you're finding the show helpful and you want to support it, there are a few tiers, including a simple $1 a month option to just say thanks. For $5 a month, you can get access to the patrons only feed that has a pre-show and a post-show in addition to the regular podcast all in one feed. You all know that the good stuff happens after the official mics are off, right? If you can't support financially, I totally understand. But I'd love it if you left a five-star review or told a friend about the podcast. If you have any questions or feedback, I'd love to hear that as well. Send it to questions at workshoptherapypodcast.com and I'll get it on the show. So now a big thank you to all the patrons. Mr. Matthew from Margiano Serio. Brad from Brad's Customs, Keith Drennan from Blackthorn Concepts, Brandon Millichamp with Tectonic Creations, The Grant Alexander, Carol Ann Jeanette Racine, Overall Makerworks, Waffle Beaver, Ed Johns of ButtJoints.com, and Miguel Angel Viela. 